Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the sixth webinar tonight, which the topic is meat quality. With the title being Lost on the Journey, Does Eating Quality of Beef Matter? And we've got an exceedingly exciting uh, hour in front of us, and we've got our guest speaker this evening of Professor Nigel Scollin, who is Director of the Institute for Global Food Security and a Professor of Animal Health at Queen's University, Belfast. Nigel will highlight the key challenges in red meat and will focus on product quality and in particular eating quality of beef and the approaches to me measuring quality. We also have our two ambassador farmers, James Evans, who farms in Shropshire, and Sam, Ches Sam Chesney from Northern Ireland, who will also speak on the steps they are taking to address eating quality and the challenges they are facing. So this is funded, this whole webinar session has been funded by EIT Food, which we're very um, fortunate to be able to secure funding. And in conjunction with Queen's University, Hockenheim University, University of Turin, John Deere, ABP, AgriSearch, um, and AIA, we've been able to carry out um, webinars fortnightly. The aim of these webinars have been able to educate, upskill, and demonstrate, and have general discussions about key themes within agriculture, within beef farming, that we're currently um, facing. With that, you don't want to hear from me too much more, so I would like to hand over to James Evans, um, and James is going to give a quick 10 minutes on, on his experiences and his thoughts around beef eating quality. James, over to you. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to speak to you again for, I think, the sixth and final one of these, and, and I'm glad to see we've saved the, the best subject to last anyway. Kind of my take on all this really is that obviously I switched to organic production three years ago and went down a grass-based system. By doing that, I realized that we were potentially had a premium product to sell. On the back of that, I got approached by a high-end retail butcher wanting to source proper beef. And I, and I asked him what, what his theory on proper beef was because he was struggling to get it. And he wanted grass-fed beef that was 24 months old with a fat class of a minimum of 4L, preferably 4H. And a lot of that was due to the intramuscular fat, animals laying down fat naturally, uh, as opposed to being forced upon them, which, which produced a better marbling product. So by doing that, we had a far better flavour, and the marbling was better. You know, and I, I think the cattle we're, we're producing, the stabiliser cattle, when they're, when they're obviously in the States, marbling is the biggest profit driver. For, for cattle over in America and it probably is in, in Australia as well because they're actually paid on it. And, it, and it, it's got me thinking really that you know we're, we're missing a trick here and is there somebody else taking the profit out the farmer's pockets you know the quality of, of meat that we're producing. You know and it's dawned on me really since I've kind of cut out the middleman in, in some of my markets we're dealing straight with with butchers and chefs and restaurants I'm getting direct feedback now from these people telling me what is good and, and you know, and sometimes what isn't as well. And, you know, that, that's really, it's, it's changed the way I farm and changed the way I think about cattle because in the past we would, you know, load up a wagon, put it, you know, go with them. Even if we saw those animals killed, we, we're never getting any feedback about how those animals killed or, or how, how they actually ate. You know, and, and I think as an industry, really, we've become disconnected with the prod, with you know, with what we're producing. You know, I, I look back now, and I was just a commodity beef producer, but now I see myself more as a, as you know, a, a niche sort of food producer. You know, and it's got me sort of thinking a lot of things. Really, uh, you know, I was previously a board member on HDB, and I, I joined with the sole aim of trying to change the Europe grading system and trying to get an eating quality system in. And we kind of hit a brick wall, really, when it, it came to processes. There's a huge appetite for farmers. Uh, and I think within the sort of catering industry to change the way that, that cattle are graded. But it seems that, that, that perhaps the processors don't want to pass that on to the farmers. You know, I, I don't know. I have a lot of questions and maybe it's my job to stir things up a little bit tonight. But, you know, I, I wonder whether the processors are actually doing it behind the scenes and, and trying to move those carcasses on for eating quality uh, and then sort of retaining any sort of uplifting profits as opposed to putting it back to the farmers. 
you know, it's all part of, of what we're talking about tonight. I, I honestly believe that if the grading system was changed, it could change the way that farmers are produced cattle overnight, rather than incentivizing E-grade cattle, which are hard to finish, uh, which perhaps offer a, a poor eating experience. If farmers were properly incentivized to produce a, an R4L carcass with extremely good marbling that, that ate and tasted well, we would actually perhaps increase beef sales and get people returning back and we'd have far more consistency in, in our product because there's nothing worse than, you know, two people can have a steak, one be good, one be bad, and of course they won't buy that, they'll go back to eating chickens. So, you know, I, I think we've got a huge amount of work to do with India's industry and I think if we can work together then, um, yeah, there's huge strides to be made. But I think I'll uh, hand over to the expert in all this, um, Professor Nigel Scollin, anyway. Thank you very much, James. Um, I'll hand over to Nigel, Professor Nigel Scrollin. Lost on the journey, does the eating quality of beef really matter? Nigel, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, James, and thank you for all attending tonight. Just on what's in front of us there now, hopefully you can all see it, the, res the, the results of the, the survey. Uh, rather interesting, 50, 59% say we, uh, we do have a problem with eating quality, 41% we do not. Do we need a system uh, to go beyond uh, Europe grading system? Very definite, yes. Uh, and do we need to be able to measure the eating quality and reward? Very, very definitive, yes. So let's take that forward over the next 25 minutes or so. And what I'd like to share with you really is a journey which I have been tracking, which has really been happening over the last 25 years or so. And really it's, it relates to the development of what I, uh, what I would suggest is the, the most advanced system that there is now in the world for being able to measure and reward eating quality. So I'll come to that in a minute. But in relation to considering tonight, and um, particularly the title that I selected, Lost on the Journey, Does Eating Quality of Beef Matter? And, and really, I, I was thinking about all of the, the complex issues that we've been discussing in this series of seminars over the last couple of months reflects the complexity of the of matters that hit us, whether it's at the farm end, processing, retail, or the research end. You know, there are many factors, and I'm going to highlight some of those for you in, in a moment. But what I wanted to highlight is some words that James uh, Evans used a moment ago that, you know, just to remind us that we are in the food business. And these are some words lifted from the, uh, the Dimbleby re Review of the National Food Strategy in England when it was launched about uh, 15 months ago. These words were used. No part of our economy matters more than food. Food's vital for life. And for one in eight of us, it is a vital source of our livelihoods. And no decisions have such a direct impact on our lives and our well-being as the choices we make about what we eat. So I use that just to uh, reflect on the importance of the sector uh, to our economy, to our lives that we're involved with. Without going into it in any great depth, I could would suggest to you that the future in pro providing proteins to people is actually very good indeed. We have a, a growing world population, big demand for more protein, including within that, the demand for uh, livestock sourced protein, which is of course what we uh, are interested in, in providing. But if we go to consumers today and ask them, what are, what are the four big issues that are really, that they are really concerned about? Then here are the four big issues that you, you typically hear about. Very concerned about environmental climate change, issues around in around uh, welfare. We talked about that two weeks ago. Issues around linkages between health of the food we eat, the meat that we eat, and air health and air well-being. And finally, the integrity of the product. So if you tell me that that product is grass-fed and it is from Shropshire Iron in England, uh, prove it. You know, so we want absolute full integrity in, in what we are delivering through to consumers. Now, those are the sort of the four big issues. And then I thought, as we go along the journey, 
where do, where does quality sit within that? Where do, where do I see eating quality within that? And hence, looking back a moment ago there, that's where I thought about uh, the, the, the title selected for tonight. For me, absolutely quality, quality, quality is absolutely paramount. So having said what I just said in that previous slide, that does not by any means uh, suggest that quality is not important. It is absolutely critical. And I would suggest to you that quality is becoming increasingly important dimension for consumers. And that's particularly driven uh, in around uh, price increases, availability of product and quality product. Then generally there, there are very close correlations between what you charge for a product availability of product and what consumers expect in terms of that, that aspect of what is quality. So when we talk about quality, there's two, two dimensions to this illustrated in this slide for you. When we think about eating quality of, of a food or in this case meat, we think about the tenderness of that product. In, in old language that used to be the sort of the boot leather test. If it doesn't pass the boot leather test in your mouth when you're, when you're chewing, biting and enjoying that, that experience, then you will not think about the juiciness or certainly not think about the flavor experience because you've just been hit with, with a problem of uh, perhaps an unacceptable degree of toughness within that product. So generally, the th there's three key aspects in there, tenderness, juiciness, and flavor. But we also think about product quality. And product quality, briefly, is a much wider concept and could include, for example, some of the issues that are highlighted here. So the origin of the product, the production system. So we heard from James Evans talking about Shropshire, talking about an organic system, uh, et cetera. It could relate to the environmental footprint through the, the life cycle analysis or carbon balance, as we heard four weeks ago uh, in this series of, uh, of webinars. It could relate to differentiating on aspects of of, of welfare or perceived welfare, or it could relate to nutritional aspects uh, of the product. So for example, grass-fed beef, we know there are additional nutritional benefits with grass-fed uh, systems compared to high cereal systems. So these are different aspects that can come together collectively under an umbrella of product quality. So we have eating quality and we have product quality. So, here we are, we're consumers, we're all consumers of these, uh, these products. And there you are, which one of those are you going to buy? Which is better and why? Any idea? And this is where I want to uh, introduce for you where the, what, what, was the, what happened in Australia if we go right back to 1996. Okay, it's quite a long time back where in Australia they set up cooperative research centers uh, and one of them was what called the Beef CRC, the Beef Cooperative Research Center. And it was very much focused in understanding difficulty, a substantial difficulty in domestic consumption of beef in that country. It was falling, the beef was not meeting consumer expectations and there was also no strong relationship noted between eating quality and beef. And that set about a 20 year program, uh, industry led uh, in a pre-competitive uh, space seeking to develop a consumer driven prediction model of beef, beef eating quality. And that's what's been developed in Australia. I'm gonna share that with you. And I know some of you know this in some detail and that's brilliant. So I'm gonna share that with you in a little bit in, in the next, uh, five or 10 minutes, and then I'm going to share with you our experiences of developing an eating quality prediction model based on work that we've been doing in Wales. So there's two, two components coming up in the remainder of the presentation. So the Meat Standards Australia MSA grading system is very much focused on delivering what the consumer requires or satisfying the consumer. And it takes a PASIP approach to grading. So PASIP uh, is P, is a palatability. 
analysis of critical control points across the whole production chain that can impact on eating quality. And you'll, you'll notice uh, the blue line there running from conception down to the consumer and a, and a feedback uh, going from the consumer back up the processing chain, if you like. So I just want to, to highlight that as you move across that production from on farm through to the factory, pre and post slaughter, uh, through to the kitchen, the, cook the cooking methods, all of those are critical control points that ultimately affect the end eating quality. But we also know that typically about 60% of the eating quality variation is to do with pre and post slaughter and forward to the consumer, end of, end of that uh, equation. And there's still 40 odd percent to do with what's happening on farm in the, from the growth of that animal. And of course, growth starts at conception. It does not start at day one when the animal arrives uh, in this world. There is a lot happening inside in the growth of the, of the animal inside the mother. Of course, genetics is important. The nutrition, the environment that that animal is exposed to and grows in are very important factors. So the Australians took a passive approach to delivering on palatability and across a very extensive research program set out to understand the significance of all of these different factors on, on eating quality and aligned with that to actually build a predictive model of eating quality for the consumer. So effectively, what the Meat Standards Australia system does is grid meat according to various categories as illustrated here. And they call their meat quality MQ4 score is what they talk about. And consumers uh, over lots and lots of beef that has been taken from different production systems, different processing systems, et cetera, et cetera. Thousands and thousands of samples have been taken and actually tasted by consumers and consumers have scored them according to these uh, categories here and you'll see in a moment. And from that, they've been able to build up a model that will actually predict very accurately eating quality. That model allows the Australians to be able to uh, define meat uh, into either that that is premium, so you can see to the right hand side of the scale here, what they call better than every day, good every day or unsatisfactory. So they also talk about three star, four star, five star, good every day, three star, better than every day, four star, premium, uh, five star being premium. So Let's stop on that for a moment and look at uh, what we have uh, in Europe. This is what, of course, we use uh, to grade our animals today. So we pay on weight, we pay on confirmation, and we pay on fat score. The problem with this, of course, is that consumers do not eat carcasses. But let's just have a quick look at what, what do we know about the relationships between the, the Europe classification system and actual eating quality. So, so the next couple of slides, I just share with you the results which were published uh, in around 2016 of the, the, the link between confirmation score and predicted eating quality using uh, an, Australian, uh, an Australian model, the MQ4. So effectively, you can see here that there is no relationship at all between uh, Europe classification and, and eating quality. It does not help at all. Uh, similarly, if we look at fat, it's the same situation. Does, there is no relationship at all between increasing fatness and eating quality scores. So the Europe system does not help us. And you might say, well, that's to be 
expected. The Europe system came in for a completely different purpose, uh, but that's the system we still got having it in, and we've had it in our industry really for, for at least the last 40 to 45 years, and we're still working on it. Whereas others are starting to move much more rapidly as illustrated and more coming up in a moment in terms of what our Australians are doing, or as we heard from James Evans, in terms of what the what our American uh, colleagues are doing. So here are some of the issues then, if we turn ourselves back and uh, look at what con consumers are facing, it's very hard for them to distinguish eating quality. Now, yes, there'll be different products that are presented, different price ranges, etc. Uh, and that may or may not link to eating quality. They get inconsistent red meat eating experiences. Sometimes it's great, sometimes it's not great. And if a consumer has a bad eating experience, we know from research that it's anywhere between eight and 11 weeks before they will come back again. That's a long time. So that's a return, return to purchase concept. So a bad experience, lasts a long time uh, and finally the way that, that the way that meat is graded doesn't align with uh, with what they end up tasting so that's what i what i just shared with you uh, a moment uh, a moment ago okay so that's uh, part one of the the presentation i i want to take you forward now and just share with you a journey that we've been on over the last uh, two years this is a, a project uh, in Wales, uh, headed up by Ivers and Aberystwyth University and uh, my, my colleague there, uh, Dr. Pip Nicholas, uh, myself at Queen's University and involving partners um, in, in Wales, uh, but also Birkenwood International, Lord Polkinghorne and his team in Australia, in, engaged in developing uh, a model of eating quality working against the background of principles in the protocols that have been used uh, within MSA. So we're using MSA protocols, but we're not using an MSA model to do the predictions. We're actually, we're actually developing uh, our own model of eating quality in, in beef and being able to demonstrate its utility and application in the context of the red meat sector in, in Wales. And this, this project has involved working uh, with five uh, processors, including uh, ABP and uh, Dunbia and Dawn, uh, have been very actively involved in accessing their plants and providing carcasses to be graded, et cetera, um, et cetera. So there's two aspects to this work, uh, one of which I'm just going to highlight very briefly. Across five abattoirs at two time points, one in February 2019 and the other in August 2019, we graded according to MSA protocols by a licensed MSA grader some 2,090 carcasses. And along with that, we gathered information on the traits that are indicated on the bottom left hand side of that slide. So that was really to give us a handle on the, the variation in all of these traits that exist within a population, 2000 carcasses in, in wheels, and also to give us uh, an indication of what variation there was in eating quality or predicted eating quality according, according to a model that Birken, Birkenwood International uh, were able to apply. So I'm not going to be saying any more about that work tonight because it's a, it's a large piece, other than to say there was very large variation in eating quality, okay, from good to bad. So it evidenced what, in terms of the first question you had tonight, do we have a problem with eating quality? 59% said yes. So I think our data from the, the 20, 2090 carcasses very much uh, would support that view. Now, what I'm gonna do in a little bit more detail is the next part of it. So what we actually did was take samples from a subpopulation 
of the carcasses that were sampled, the 2000 odd carcasses. We took samples from, from 60 cattle involving 90 sides of the, of the cattle across four production systems in Wales, the beef suckler, dairy, dairy cross beef, the cull cow and the young bull production system. So four production systems. We took four uh, cuts, the fillet, which you're very familiar with, uh, the loin, the sirloin, the feather blade. The feather blade is, is from, the, from the small shoulder, very small muscle in the shoulder that can be uh, more tough, but actually can be very flavoursome. Uh, and then the eye round, or sometimes called the salmon, which is part of the, the, the eye of the silver side, so uh, the hind end of the animal, if you like. So we took four cuts. Uh, we engaged uh, two hanging methods for carcass processing. One was what we call the Achilles hang. Achilles hang is basically where you hang from the Achilles tendon. That is one that typically is used by, by the industry. Whereas the comparison was what's called tender stretch, which is where you, you hook, if you like, on the, on the top end, on the hind end of the animal, and it stretches the back of the animal and it kicks the, it kicks the legs out at 90 degrees from the carcass. So it's called tender stretch. Tender stretch is a technique which has been demonstrated uh, to improve tenderness in a number of muscles, not all muscles, but a number of muscles, but generally is something that's not widely adopted in, in the industry. So we brought in two, two methods of, of hanging, really to create differences in eating quality. And finally, we had two different um, maturation periods. As, as we know, maturation can help improve the eating quality of a product, aging uh, for seven days and 21 days. So that was really the, the construct of the, of the, of the piece of the, the, the work. Samples were gathered in February 2019 and August 2019. And then we took these samples and went out to uh, consumers across Wales. And, and, and some, of them, some of them are actually into, into activities across in England and went out to consumers and said, what do you think of these products? So this is just a, a quick indication of when we were taking the samples. Uh, the samples were taken from the carcasses and then they were uh, appropriately labelled, vacuum packed and stored until utilised in the consumer work. We had 1,200 consumers involved in, in the work. We run 20 events and at each event we had 60 participants, three lots of 20. Uh, coming in to sample some, some of the meat. You can see the meat was all grilled as indicated there and people would sit at tables. Uh, you can see appropriately socially distanced here. This is just before we got into that new world of social distancing, but you can see that there were little cards up to separate, uh, to separate people so that there was no communication uh, across, et cetera, et cetera. So these events took place across Wales. Uh, we made very good use of the agricultural colleges in Wales, Aberystwyth University, rugby clubs, but you can see that there's a wide variety of organisations and a wide distribution of uh, society came together uh, to play a role in, in this activity. And of course, it, it is also an extremely good way of communicating uh, with consumers about issues in in livestock agriculture in the beef sector uh, etc uh, just quickly in terms of the demographics this just confirms that we were dealing with a, a very diverse population that's extremely important for conducting conducting this type of work and the demographics that were there map very well to uh, the very the, the data that's in the latest census in wales and what we did basically was ask consumers to score the product according to what you see on the left hand side there. So they were given uh, a, a piece of paper with line scores and they simply drew a line uh, where they felt the product was not tender to very tender. 
juicy, uh, liking of flavor, and overall liking. And so, for example, in the, the, the one that's given there, it has a score of tenderness 60, juiciness uh, 80, flavor 54, overall liking 72. And on the right hand side, they also had to indicate uh, if they would allocate it to a category unsatisfactory, good being three star, better being four star, premium being five star. That's what they were asked to do. And from that, we then, with the assistance of Birkenwood International, Rod Polkinghorn and team, calculated the eating quality score, the EQ score. And that works out as a function, which is 30% of tenderness, 10% of juiciness, 30% of flavor, and 30% of overall, to give you your, your, your overall eating quality score. Okay, uh, and just to confirm that in this piece of work then, each consumer had seven samples to, to taste. Uh, and the first of those samples on the top right there is everybody got a same common first sample to act as a finding the baseline for the population. And then they received in a specific sequence, the specific samples that that, that, that individual consumer was going to, uh, going to receive. So remember, uh, there were 1,200 consumers involved in this, 1,200, okay? Now, I want you to remember that figure because I'm going to show you uh, in about five minutes' time uh, what that number is in Australia in terms of where they are and their database today. Okay, so there's three or four slides coming up here now which will give you, uh, to use that wonderful uh, uh, language, will give you a flavour of the, of the, of the results. This slide here just simply shows you that consumers were very readily able to distinguish eating quality differences, okay? So if you look at the bottom, that little wave, if you like, then the bottom right-hand side uh, shows you that there is a, a grouping of meat samples which are scoring very high, so that's premium. The next layer up, the second curve, is basically the the good every day the the next one in the in the middle that big band is basically the three star and then the top one is unsatisfactory so this confirms very readily that our consumers were able to distinguish very clearly differences in eating quality and i think we all know that as consumers of, of meat you know we can distinguish what's good what's less good and what's poor. And this just evidences that very clearly indeed. So just to give you uh, an indication of a little bit more of the results, uh, this is the results in relation to maturation. So you need to look at the data on the left-hand table there. I don't have an active mouse at, at, at my end. So I just, if you look at the data on the left-hand side there, you, uh, this is maturation. So this is this is either using Achilles tendon, which is traditional method of, of hanging versus hip suspension. So basically what, what it shows is there's no uh, effect on the fillet or the feather blade, but a very large positive effect on the sirloin. So if we pull out that sirloin effect, Gillian, if you go down to point number three, the column of sirloin on it, you'll see at, at, uh, at day seven, it's uh, of maturation, it's 48 and a score of 60 uh, with hip suspension, okay, with HIP. So a very distinct elevation in, in uh, eating quality score uh, with that's of maturation. So we're, we're going from 7 to 21, my mistake. We're going from 48 to 56, okay, and maturation for sirloin. Then if we go down to each bone and, and hip hang, then you'll see that we're going from 48 to 60 and from 56 to 60 uh, benefit for hip suspension and similar benefits for, for the eye round for the, for the salmon. A neutral effect on the feather blade and actually a negative effect on fillet. And that's because of the fact that 
the Achilles tendon, when you stretch on the Achilles tendon, hanging a carcass, then the, the fillet will be naturally stretched. And if you like, uh, it, uh, it helps with the maturation. So the, in that case, the, the hip suspension did not, have a, did not have a benefit and actually had a negative effect relative to the, to the, to the AT, to the Achilles tendon. So again, this just demonstrates that, um, that consumers are actually able to pull out these uh, results on maturation and H bone hanging. So to go a little bit uh, deeper, this just uh, illustrates how consumers were able to determine three star, four star, five star across uh, the four categories of meat used, the eye round, the feather blade, the sirloin, and, and the fillet. But actually, you could get three and four star meat from any of those cuts, but very few of them were actually giving five star. So as an example, if you look at the three star, the good every day, which has an eating quality range down the bottom there in pink of 40 to 61, then the best at delivering that were the, the fillets, the data at the bottom, at the bottom end there, and the worst were the eye rounds. So eating quality is not simply determined by cut. And again, consumers could pull this out. Uh, and one final example in here of the complexity of uh, eating quality assessment. This is basically uh, showing, for example, that across all of the cattle types in, in young bulls, there was no five-star product uh, in the animal sampled. So if you look on the young bulls in the bottom right-hand side, in, in the middle of the, of the graph there, you will see that there were, there were none of, of the muscles that managed to hit five star according to the category defined uh, by our consumers. And rather interestingly, in contrast, you will see that, that, uh, that Welsh cows did have some five star fillet product. But again, you will note there's a very large range uh, in eating quality across these cattle types. So cattle types does not simply describe uh, eating quality. But when you've got a tool that measures eating quality, then it can help to remove the variation and it can help to deliver a consistent uh, product to consumers. So this is just illustrates uh, the results in terms of a question we asked uh, our consumers on what would they pay for what they'd consider to be a product that is not satisfactory. And you can see uh, on the top, the, the top of the slide there, they were putting that price at in or around £4.25 a kilo. Whereas if it was a five-star product, they would be willing to go up to £22 per kilo. So that's basically an increase of uh, 221%. So this maps very well with previous work done in this space across countries, which clearly demonstrates that consumers are willing to pay provided the product is guaranteed to deliver uh, on, on eating quality. So just to sum up on that, Welsh consumers can consistently identify differences in quality. We need to be able to talk about uh, describing meal satisfaction, not the carcass, because we're, we're trying to satisfy and keep with keep our consumers with us by delivering consistent eating quality. You simply cannot rely on cut or cattle type to determine eating quality. There's much more to it. And if you get it wrong, then consumers will harshly penalize an inconsistent product, but they will pay premiums for a product that eats consistently well. And of course, I, I would contend to you that that is a very important route to sustaining uh, sustainability and profitability is, is through satisfied consumers. So I'm just going to leave you with a few, uh, a few final thoughts. Is it time to start moving from grading based on the, the Europe scale and the fat class system? And if so, how do we actually go about it? 
and moving towards a system that I've been outlining that is now very advanced within Australia, but actually having a system which is, if you like, our own uh, model of eating quality and, and working with others across the UK and Ireland, uh, across Europe to develop uh, an, an eating quality model for, for ourselves. So this, this is just bringing up with you, highlighting that if you go online and Google Meat Standards Australia today, you'll see they've just published their annual report for 2019, 2020. So this is the sort of very high level headline figures that their industry is now putting out there. 40, 48% of the cattle slaughtered in Australia are now graded according to, to MSA. So that's full MSA grading. There'll be a much higher proportion of those that are being produced according to MSA uh, protocols. Uh, but for particular reasons, uh, one did not qualify for it to be graded. So, for example, if they didn't have adequate fat cover, less than three three millimeter uh, back fat, they actually fall outside uh, qualifying to go into the MSA the MSA system. Uh, their national average MSA index is now fifty eight. If you think back to the data I was showing you from Wales in a moment. We were looking at figures there from anywhere from 30 up to up to 80 but their their national average now is 58 and if you go down to uh second from the bottom on the left there you will see that nine an additional um 19 000 samples have been tested by 2800 consumers the total numbers of samples tasted now is 1.2 million tests by 170,000 consumers. So in that piece of work we did in Wales, it's 1,200 consumers. So you can see over the last 20 years, Australia has been working on this, they've built up a very extensive database. This just uh, shows you uh, the data that they have in terms of their MSA index, the top 1%, 5%, 10%, and the bottom. So their range in the average goes from 46 to 67. And you can see they also break it down in terms of basically a grass fed system and a green fed system. If you go on Google, what's called my MSA, then you will see that producers actually get information back to them uh, on their eating quality. And at farm level, they are thinking uh, and breeding and developing uh, their animals in relation to pushing forward on an eating quality uh, metric. OK, and it's, it's a bit like what we've been saying in this series of webinars. If you if you cannot measure it, you cannot manage it. So the Australians are now in a position and have been in the position for at least the last 10 years that they actually can measure and manage. And this slide, the final one, summarizes that. This is the sort of progress they're making in their MSA index over time. So I think that's a, that's a huge challenge. Uh, for us to uh, to stimulate ourselves to think about how do we get onto this journey, what we need to do to move to an eating quality based system. Final slide. So with that, James, I'm over and out. Thank you very much. Sam, over to you, please. Okay, thank you very much, James. And very, very thought provoking, Nigel. Thank you very much. James Evans and myself both produce beef both want beef to taste its very, very best, but on completely different scales of operation. James is organic, free range. I'm quite intensive and would, would feed would feed a whole lot more than James. So, you know, we're still after the same market uh, together. And we want the consumer to have a very good eating experience. The most important, you know, the most important things for me is the providence. We want people to know where their food comes from. It's, a, it's an, a, a, an idealistic sort of way to look at it. But people think their beef comes from a green and pleasant land with trees and um, birds singing in, in the wind. And, you know, this is what we want to sell. On this farm, what we are doing to try and improve our eating quality, although we've got no real measure of that, we're using genetics from the very start. We're looking for high intramuscular fat in the bulls we're, pre we're, we're using now. Um, we have had a problem, um, many carcasses have been lean in the past, 
but we're addressing that as quickly as we possibly can by using that. In the future, genomics will play, will play a role. Um, I do know of some research going on in New Zealand from bulls from Australia that if people use these bulls with MSA scores, the sellers of that premium beef will get a premium for their meat. So it's very important that does filter down through the chain. Other things we can be looking at, we should be looking at uh, payments for yield of beef and specific cuts of beef. The technology we have nowadays and many of the factories can do this. Um, we're probably not using this to the best of our advantages. There are some very, very good um, abattoirs and meat companies who are doing a tremendous job. Um, I'm going to tell them, say this now because I know they're going to get a slating later on in the questions. You know, they have, they're putting beef into many supermarkets and for example, other supermarkets are available. Tesco's finest. You know, I dare anybody to, to get a, a Tesco's Aberdeen Angus finest steak and not like it. So that is a very, very good, good job they're doing. But again, those are specific um, criteria you have to meet. A certain age, a certain weight, a certain way of, of um, feeding the animals and, um, you know, and a certain way they're finished. Very important stress. Uh, here we have identified stress as, as being a big problem. You know, our cattle leave the farm early in the morning. They tunnel down the road in the lorry to, to our local abbot for an hour and a half away. And hopefully they go straight up the line. So there's no stress. There's that meat should be a whole lot better. So these are these are things that um, that we are trying to do. You know, we can, the farmer can only do so much, but he can do a whole lot. Mixed species swords. We're we talked about this maybe week two. This could be a possible way of increasing the the quality, the micronutrients in our meat. Um, again, it needs researching. It's just a, a stab in the dark. Um, these are all things that that we can look at. But I, I do believe that. We have to try. Again, the culture in all of these countries, Australia and America, is much different to the UK. Ready meals are, were, were a big thing uh, post-pandemic, or sorry, pre-pandemic, but now people are starting to cook more. The culture of Australians barbecuing um, and knowing what good meat tastes like and not being afraid to look at cuts of meat. People here seem to want nice pink uh, meat that has not been um, hung any other way than just slaughtered and, and put on, on, a, on a slab to sell. Um, whereas in Australia, I would think, and other companies are hanging for 21 days. And on eating quality, you know, it all varies. Some of the best steak I've had was in France and it was a, a 10 year old limousine cow. But the best beef I've had here in Northern Ireland was a 425 kilo uh, limousine bull, an E3. And I've never tasted meat like it. And you, the steak was so tender, you could tear them in half. I always tell the story, if you're really hungry, you know, tell anybody who, who doesn't think they like meat, just picture a nice fillet steak, uh, medium, well done, uh, on, a, on, a, on a, a mound of Irish champ and a nice glass of red wine. And I dare anybody not to go away and think, boy, I could just eat that now. So another thing is fat. Fat is a very emotive subject. Do we have the Wagyu, which is all grainy white fat to it? Well, actually it puts me off, Never mind the consumer off or do we have a nice uh, layer of fat around the outside there's lots of things we can do but i must have stressed that we all must work together in this um whether you're an organic farmer like james or whether you're a, a meat plant owner like abp if we don't all work together we will be eroded by the white meats by chicken who is a very bland meat and they just mix it with sauce and it tastes very well so i think i leave it there because i know we're going to run short of questions uh, so, James, uh, Deborah, I leave it there and we can catch up on the questions. Thank you very much, Sam. Right, questions and discussions now. Some uh, Loads of questions are coming through. So any question doesn't get answered, we will be answering these and, and circulating it um, in the next 24, 48 hours. Right, question number one has had the most thumbs up. And this is actually targeted towards myself. And I'm going to ask Nigel it, really. What is... <laughs> preventing the industry from adopting these standards and who should lead the way on this? So I'm, I'm not sure I've got any good answer to that. Um, I, I think the industry is, is ready uh, to consider how to take this uh, forward. Uh, but we, we need to be bringing together the processors at a high level within those businesses to have a roundtable discussion on it. 
I think we're in a very different position to when parallel work or some of the the early work was done in this MSA type work uh, in the UK and Ireland uh, back 2008, 2010. It's a very different era now. So I think the industry is very much in a position now where it, it knows it needs to move. And one of the analogies I use around this, James, is it's a bit like the car manufacturers are, are very competitive, but yet when it comes to technologies that they have to use to validate uh, some of the, the metrics they're producing. So for example, testing their seat belts, they'll all be working to a standard. So this is exactly the same thing. We, we work to a particular uh, internationally recognized set of, set of rules and a methodology for measuring. We all do it and we all can grade our meat according to eating quality. Uh, we can produce that meat in very different ways to get the eating quality that's required for the particular markets. Uh, that, uh, that that businesses seek to uh, to access uh, and so on. So I, I, I think the timing is absolutely correct. Who should lead in doing it all? I think um, uh, collectively, uh, as all who are sitting here tonight listening to this, I and a group of others would be happy to lead on this. And I would I would really welcome uh, individual thoughts on that. So. Do, do email or make contact with me. It's an area that we are passionately considering in, in terms of how do we take it, how do we take it forward? The timing's correct. So let's let's do it and drive forward our industry. It's very needed. Super, thank you very much, Nigel. Right, next question. Um, with developments in technology, should we not also look to implement yield and value of specific cut from a carcass? Yep combination with eating value yeah right. no, and that's a that's a really good point and that's precisely uh, an additional dimension which i didn't have time to go into uh, that australia <laughs> i'm sorry that uh, a lot of roads lead to australia and examples here uh, otherwise i'd be ending up in the us but australia have uh, their principle is to move down uh, a value based uh, being able to measure yield uh, using technologies uh, uh, including video image analysis on, on beef, uh, but they've also worked up on doing a massive rollout at the moment, assessing the use of what's called DEXTA technology, dual X-ray uh, technology from being able to measure yield in lamb. So you can really get very detailed information on total meat yield, individual cuts, et cetera. And then if you combine that with what I was talking about in terms of eating quality, then those two factors give you a new methodology to be able to move forward uh, and reward uh, and pay on, on eating quality. So if you like, perfect question, that's where, the, that's where our major competitors are. And I can assure you in terms of the science underpinning where they are, it really is excellent. Right, James and Sam, there's one for you. Um, give Nigel a bit of a breather. Could it be that some breed societies won't accept some are better than others and put a lot of pressure on the meat plants not to go down the road of paying farmers for real quality beef? James, can I ask you that first, please? And Sam, if you have any comments to answer after. Oh, yeah, you, you put me on the spot there. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, I, I, I think the trouble is that at the moment, obviously, the, the way that people perceive they're making the most money is on meat yield so you know if you have a, a larger carcass which yields better with a better grade that's what the process are incentivizing and until actually the incentive is, is turned away and put towards um, eating quality yeah there's certain breeds which obviously are, are swayed more to, to yield and there's certain breeds probably more native breeds and your, your stabilized type breeds um, will be more focused towards eating quality so the, the industry can change overnight, like I said before, but while there, there's still an incentive for E-grade carcasses, there isn't going to be any change happening anytime soon. I think I would simply add, James, that there is as much variation within breeds as there are. You know, that's a bigger issue, the variation within a breed, than it is uh, across, uh, across breeds. And ultimately, if you have a model of eating quality, then it, it will be able to, to pull out on, on, on the criteria that I was describing. 
And, and also just to add that when you start going into breeds, uh, at the very beginning, I define product quality. So you start to go into things like uh, ge ge geographical orange, uh, origin, the breed, the production system, etc. So you start to go beyond eating quality into wider aspects that consumers recognize in a, in, as, as part of a definition of product quality. Yeah, yeah, Nigel, yeah, I, I agree with you there. But yeah, on, the, on the breed thing, you know, the breed societies can't even get together and have the same recording system for <laughs> ABVs. Uh, if they can't do that, how can they ever agree on a on you know on, on a taste uh, on a on a taste thing that we that we would like? Do you want to grow animals with big heads and heavy bones because they look good, or are are we are we you know a lot of people showing cattle? Uh, I, mean, I don't want to get anybody was saying this, but a lot of the commercial show cattle, you know, some of them some of them aren't fit to eat; they're too hard. Uh, and, I, and I'm a man that produces E grade cattle as well, but you know. They're not my be all and end all. I think a more balanced approach needs to be taken um, when we're when we're selling beef. I have gone down the road with some blade calves and they're not pretty to look at, but they probably be taste all right uh, and they're by the right weight. But we need to be paid as a farmer point of view. We need to be paid for what we produce um, at the right level. And sometimes I don't think we are. And I do think that we should be getting um, more value on our carcass. Um, it's very, very important that happens. Nigel, another one for you. This is quite a long question. So much of this is beyond the control of the farmer. So why cast doubt on the current payment system for cattle? This research is relevant to the beef processors, not farmers. Australia went down MSA route because they have Brahman and Zebu influence in their herd. This is very different starting place to Northern Ireland. Do you have any comments for that, Nigel? Yeah, we frequently get this uh, this type of comment, but it's just not valid. We do have a different starting position. Uh, we do have a significant problem with eating quality. Uh, the, the person asking the question might I might not agree, uh, but it's certainly apparent when we looked at the data that was available to to us in Wales. So the starting point is different, but the principles are absolutely absolutely uh, critical. Uh, so I think we shouldn't get detracted with the fact that uh, Australia had a different a different suite of challenges, uh, but at least they have quantified very precisely what the input, for example, is of Boss Indicus and and uh, the importance of the of the uh, the hump measurement in relation to meat quality. They know precisely what that does in terms of eating quality. Okay. Now, we might not have the degree of hump that is in those types of cattle, but nevertheless, we have other significant factors driving variation in eating quality. But do we have them well defined and characterized? So, you know, I think we have to be very focused uh, on understanding uh, the situation in air population and then developing uh, solutions to minimizing that variation and we can only do that if we understand it and have a system for being able to measure uh, quality and verify that. And at a farm level, I would suggest to you that the, the, the system is really to do with providing guarantees to the consumer. It's not for the processor. It's very much uh, delivering to the consumer. And, you know, I highlighted that very much uh, at the beginning that that was the focus and I would suggest to you that that would be absolutely the driver in air context as well. It, you know, I, if, we, if we're getting eight to 11 weeks uh, before you get a repeat purchase, then that's not a pretty picture for our, our industry. So we should all be absolutely doing what we can to minimize uh, variation in eating quality and deliver what consumers uh, expect. And finally, in terms of... Uh, the MSA to farm end, then I really would encourage you to go and look at my MSA from the farmer end, and you will see that the data uh, is provided back to farm level uh, on their MSA scores for the cattle they're, 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 they've just had, had processed. And then the farmer is able to make decisions around how they continue to advance 
uh, issues around eating quality in farm, whether it's to do with how they grow that animal, whether it's the, the genetics or the selection of, of bulls of different EBVs for intramuscular fat, et cetera. They're actually breeding for eating quality. That's the farmer, nothing to do with the processor. It's farmer. Thank, thank you, Nigel. Right, I'm going to ask two very quick questions. I, I said one, but let's just do two very quickly. Um, Nigel, what impact, quick answer, what impact does intramuscular fat have on eating quality? Positive up to a point. Uh, increases in, in, in tenderness and flavour associated with increasing musc uh, intramuscular fat. But then, of course, you will hit a tipping point um, because you, you do get... Um, particularly in the UK and Ireland, we know our, con our consumers are very sensitive to visible fat within, within muscle. Uh, so they, you have to be very cautious with that from a, a UK perspective. Uh, but generally, it's a, it's a small positive response to increasing in intramuscular fat. And that's why there's so much attention on, on uh, understanding what drives intramuscular fat. It's the final depot to develop within the growth of an animal and breeding for it, feeding for it, uh, etc. And this is for Sam and James and Nigel, but if, Nigel, if you can answer first, what is the difference between heifer, the preferred butcher choice, and steer? And then James and, and also should we be using sex beef? James and Sam, what are your thoughts about using sex beef? I'll leave that to the farmers, James. The preferred for butcher for butcher trade is a, is a is a heifer. For a farmer, it's probably not a heifer because she's she's going to be forty or fifty kilos lighter. And again, it boils down to this, this is a business. A, a steer a steer animal will yield as, as well as a heifer, but it'll it'll be heavier. Sex beef, yep. We we haven't tried it yet. We are we were on the verge this year, but COVID stopped it um, because there's just going to be too many people uh, around the farm at, at AI time. But um, going forward next year, we, we intend to um, do a batch of cows with AI semen um, sex meal to increase our cargoes weight off farm. And really, when it boils down to grassland production and everything else, um, we, to make it pay in Northern Ireland, we need uh, kilos of cargoes. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, it all comes back to what we've been talking about tonight is eating quality. And I think if we're all going to probably kill an animal ourselves and what we want to eat, You'd kill, you know, a moderately framed heifer that would put a lot of fat on and, you know, it would eat as tender as anything. Yes, it won't yield as much. And that's the trouble with all this. If that animal would actually, you'd get paid for the eating quality of that animal. You could afford to finish it in a lighter weight or, or anything like that. So I think that that's what skews all this is that we're getting paid on the weight of that animal, which could be at the detriment to its eating quality. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, you know, we, we've done some sex semen, obviously, for different reasons for the, for the breeding herd. But, yeah, there's no reason why, if you were getting paid eating quality, you can produce all the heifers and get that top eating quality stuff. You know, you, you can make quite, quite huge gains, really, in selecting which females produce the best eating quality and with, with the best breeding animals as well. And I think there's probably a correlation as well, really, with, with for sucker cows as well, that... Uh, animals which lay down fat, which are, are good cows, would also be good eating animals as well. Super. Thanks so much, James. Right. I'm sorry we're going to have to close those questions. There are about 30 more questions to ask, so we'll answer those over the next couple of days. I'd like just to hand over to Jason Rankin, who's going to just do a quick sum up. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, James. Um, well, how do you sum up that? Certainly, it, it's been a very interesting debate, and I think not only today, but every day we've been focusing on these events, the consumer is at the heart. And kind of going through the webinars we had, we started off with Francis Lively talking about grass and consumers want grass-fed beef. They want that, those animals very much at the heart of it. We moved on to then the soil health, the multi-species, the, the biodiversity elements that can come into reducing fertilizer and so on, where we had the, the talk by Dave Humphreys and Martin Lukak. Following on then, we had an excellent talk a few weeks ago by John Gilland on carbon and carbon neutrality and lowering our carbon footprint are going to be at the heart of our beef production going on. And then on our previous session, we had Eric Morgan and Garth Arnott talking about the One Health, the One Welfare Agenda. And then today, obviously most important of all, what does the product taste like? Is it consistent? Are the consumers getting what they pay for? 
And I think none of us need to be told that in the beef industry at the UK and Ireland, we need to be going for the premium. We need to be delivering what the customer wants. The commodity market is not where we want to be. Yes, it is difficult. And I, I'm reminded of the quote by JFK, we choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are difficult. And it is going to be challenging, but we shouldn't shy away from that. And we are going to have to address these issues if we do want a future for us. But I think the real hope for our industry is in our farm ambassadors like James and like Sam, two very different farming systems, but they are both professionals. They both ask the right questions. They are both out there to do it, make a profit and provide what the consumer wants. And that's what sets them apart. And I think there was that whole thing about, you know, we have to view farming as a profession going forward. It should always have been a profession and it must be a profession. And despite James and Sam having quite different farming systems based on their location, based on their circumstances, they're both driving ahead. They're both pushing their business forward. So I would like to thank Nigel for his talk tonight and James and Sam for tonight and for the other days they have been in there. It's been a really fantastic presentation from them. This was to have been our last talk, but we are mulling over the possibility of doing a, a, a lockdown special uh, in the coming weeks to wrap the whole thing up and tie the whole thing up and start to look towards the future. But my thanks to them and my thanks to all of you who have turned up. We've had more and more people turn up every night and tonight we've had over 200 people on the, on, on the meeting. So thank you very much. And I'll hand back to James. Super, thank you very much, Jason. And I think it's all been said. Thank you very much to the guest speakers this evening. I think it's a very, very interesting subject and something that we all as farmers, processors, retailers probably need to get around the table and have a bit further discussion about. But I'd like to thank you and um, I'd like to, to thank EIT Food for the funding behind this and we will be answering the questions in the next couple of days, so look out for that. And please fill in the, fill in the feedback survey um, at the end of this presentation um, this evening um, just to hear your thoughts. So thank you very much all for listening. Thank you very much for the presentations and good evening all.